Hello, Teddy. You're very serious about this subject. Are we talking about volume today? What do you, why are you being a crackhead? Are you wired? Are you ready for your training session? Why got you snake eyes? Why, hello there, endurance nerds. Back again to question everything you've ever been told by a guy in wraparound sunglasses with a coaching certificate from the University of YouTube. Excellent. Today we're digging into one of the most abused, misquoted, and misunderstood pillars of endurance training. Volume. Because if you've been online for more than, oh, I don't know, eight seconds, you've probably been hit with one of the following sermons. High volume is the only way to build a real aerobic base. Volume is overrated. You just need polarized training. Hack your VO2 max with two 30-minute interval sessions a week and forget base miles entirely. Train less. Gain more. Run slow. Get fast. Run hard. Get hard. Hey, that's what she said. All right. Maybe not that last one. But it's confusing enough to make you want to throw your bike into a volcano and take up pickleball. And that's before someone on Reddit tells you about their friend who podiumed on an Ironman off of five hours a week in a ketogenic diet. So here's the real question. How much does volume actually matter? Not in theory, not in myth, but in real biological, will this make me faster kind of terms. Let's start here. Volume matters. It's not fake, it's not optional, and it's not just for the pros with too much time and a sponsorship deal from their local bakery. If you want the aerobic adaptations that support real endurance, think increased mitochondrial density, better fat oxidation, higher stroke volume, lower resting heart rate, more type one fiber efficiency. I can go on. You need volume. These aren't the things that you can just jam into a 45 minute hit class between Zoom calls. But, and this is the part that everyone conveniently ignores, you can't just dump hours onto your calendar like it's a Minecraft speed run. Not all volume is created equal, and more doesn't automatically mean better. If it did, every college kid working a double shift on their feet would have the aerobic system of a Kenyan marathoner. We've all seen the so-called shortcuts. It seems like every week there's a new claim. Replace long rides with micro intervals. Skip base training entirely. Get race ready off of four hours a week. And sure, time crunch models exist for a reason. Some of them work, especially for newer athletes or people coming back from a layoff. But here's the real question. Can you really swap out the volume and still get the same results? Because the internet is full of bold promises. Just 10 minutes a day. No base required. Science-based hacks to cut your training time in half. What they don't usually mention is that the athletes that they're using as proof, they've spent years building their aerobic engine before ever cutting back. So the question isn't just whether or not the shortcuts exist, it's whether you've earned the right to take them. We'll unpack that, but first let's talk about how much volume really matters in your training in the first place. Volume does not exist in a vacuum. It matters, but it's context dependent. Beginners need it to build durability, intermediates need it to expand capacity, and advanced athletes use it strategically to maintain high-end performance. But every one of those phases assumes that the volume is appropriate, repeatable, and recoverable. If it's not, it's just stress without adaptation. And remember, training time is not training load. You can train for two hours at 45% of threshold and barely move the needle. Or you can train 90 minutes with structured intensity and walk away with a week's worth of stimulus. But that doesn't mean intensity replaces volume. It just means each has a role to play. So the real answer to how much does volume matter is this. A lot if you're ready for it. Not much if you're not, and somewhere in between if you're training like a rational adult and not chasing threshold gains like a junkie chasing a dopamine hit. So let's get into why volume matters in the first place. Not just in a trust me bro kind of way, but what's actually happening inside your body when you rack up those hours. Endurance isn't just a mental grind or pain tolerance contest. It's biological. You're training your body to become more efficient at transporting and using oxygen. That means building capillaries, boosting mitochondrial content, increasing plasma volume, and upregulating those enzymes that burn fat instead of just depleting glycogen like a teenager binging energy gels. These adaptations don't come from occasional intensity spikes. They come from chronic, repeated, aerobic load. Volume is a slow cooker, intensity is a pressure cooker. Both work, but only one leaves you with sustainable base that you can actually build on. Now, here's the kicker. Most of the hallmark aerobic adaptations, the stuff that really moves the needle long term, like that increased mitochondrial density, the capillarization and fat metabolism, they don't start to compound significantly until you're logging somewhere around five hours a week consistently. Now, that doesn't mean that anything under that is wasted. You can absolutely make progress on less, especially if the training is well structured or maybe you're early in your endurance journey. But there is a volume threshold below which you are bound to hit a ceiling. Once your body habituates to that low volume, you're mostly maintaining. Maybe you're making some marginal gains. That's what a lot of athletes starts leaning harder into that anaerobic training because it feels like the only way to keep improving. And to be fair, anaerobic gains have value. They're sharp, they're measurable, and they're necessary for performance. Necessary, but not sufficient. You cannot build deep endurance by skipping the foundation and stacking firecrackers on top. Think of it like you're paying the minimum on a credit card. You're not falling behind, but you're not exactly getting ahead either. It's still training, but it's training that has a ceiling. If you want to develop durable, long haul endurance, at some point the system just needs more hours. So what qualifies as enough volume and that really depends on the sport your background and what you're trying to achieve 
So let's try to break it down. For cycling, you're typically gonna see your beginners anywhere from about three to maybe seven hours a week. They'll be getting a feel for endurance training, developing basic aerobic capacity, and building durability. Even two rides a week, if structured well, can spark major improvements at this stage. This is the barrier to entry for building basic endurance and avoiding that my legs are fine but my lungs are screaming feeling on every single climb. For your intermediates, you're looking at about six to 10 hours a week. This is where structure really matters. You're doing enough volume to layer in intentional intensity, threshold blocks, tempo, maybe some VO2 max, and still recover between sessions. Progress will come fast if you're consistent and even on relatively modest volume. For the more experienced or performance oriented, most will hover between eight and 14 hours a week. You're still technically an amateur, but this is the domain of people who might race, have specific goals, and structure their week around their training. At this stage, you're going to need some long rides, some intensity, and enough aerobic volume to build fatigue resistance. I kind of find this to be where most working adults who want to prioritize their cycling can hope to land with some sacrifices, but still have the ability to maintain some semblance of a life balance. Then there are your highly competitive amateur or advanced folks. They can range anywhere between 12 to maybe 18 or more hours per week. Now you're deep in the game. The volume range supports double days, big tempo rides, long zone two rides, and high-end intensity in a way that's fully periodized. Recovery, fueling, and life logistics start to dictate whether or not this is going to be sustainable for most athletes. Now let's talk runners. Because of the higher musculoskeletal load, the time required here is substantially less, but the stress is more. Every step is an impact event, and volume has to be earned over time, not just logged. For beginners, you're looking anywhere between two and a half to four and a half hours a week, or about 10 to 22 miles. You're building aerobic fitness, soft tissue tolerance, and basic movement economy. At this stage, even a few 30 to 45 minute runs per week can yield solid progress, especially if you're consistent and patient. Your intermediates will be around four and a half to seven and a half hours a week, or maybe 22 to 40 miles. You're running four to six days a week now, including one long run and at least one quality session. Tempo, intervals, progression runs, etc. This is the sweet spot where performance gains really start to stack up, assuming your recovery holds. For the more performance oriented runners, you step up to six and a half to nine hours a week now, or 40 to 55 miles. You're racing regularly, you're periodizing your blocks, and you're starting to use your workouts to target those specific physiological systems. This is where durability and training loads start to matter more than just mileage. And then you have your advanced or competitive amateur runners who can range anywhere from eight to over 12 hours a week, or 55 to 75 miles plus. This level is typically reserved for those more experienced distance runners with years of base and ironclad recovery protocols. You'll need to manage cumulative fatigue and biomechanical strain really carefully here because at this volume, it's not just about if something's going to flare up, it's when. And then we talk triathlon, where time basically gets eaten alive. You're training for three sports, managing three different recovery profiles, and somehow still trying to have a life. Good luck. For your beginners or those staying focused on more of the sprint or Olympic distances, six to eight hours a week is usually the baseline to train all three disciplines without neglecting one. You're going to need at least two sessions per sport, and even then you're just scratching the surface of race day readiness. For your intermediates, maybe those looking to kill their next sprint or Olympic distance, or athletes seeking to put up some respectable times at the T100 or half iron distances, 10 to 14 hours a week is where longer aerobic sessions, structured intensity, skill-focused swim workouts, and those brick runs become essential. Volume has to be balanced with recovery, especially if you're working full-time. For your more performance-oriented half Ironman athletes or those that are trying to complete a full Ironman, we're at about 12 to 17 hours a week. You're building more race specificity, you're testing nutrition, and doing multi-hour bike run combos. This level requires careful periodization and the ability to really absorb that high cumulative load. And then for your advanced or highly competitive athletes, especially in those competitive full Ironman age groups, peak weeks can range anywhere from 16 to 22 hours plus per week. At this point, triathlon is a part-time job. You're likely doing double sessions, long bricks, and four to six hour rides weekly. If your sleep, nutrition, and stress management aren't dialed, this volume will break you before the race ever gets a chance. Now, those numbers are not gospel. They're ballparks. If you're poised to tell me that you just finished your last Ironman on nine hours a week, I believe you. I'm speaking in very broad terms here to give you a realistic framework and to clarify something a lot of people miss. It's not about your biggest week. It's about what you can do consistently over time. A single 20-hour week doesn't impress anyone if it's followed by a six-hour crash and burn because you've overreached. And just to be clear, these are training hours. They don't include prep time, gear setup, cool downs, uh, stretching, recovery protocols, meals, naps, or the part where you stare at your ceiling for 20 minutes rethinking your life during a bunk. This is only the time spent training. 
Knowing these ballpark ranges can help you to assess whether your real life calendar can support the performance you're chasing, not just in theory, but in practice. So now that you've got a sense for those training ranges, how do you figure out if your current volume is actually working for you? And for that, you need to ask yourself these three questions and answer them honestly. This isn't just about doing too much or too little. It's about whether the amount of training that you're doing is producing real sustainable progress. First, are you recovering from your current volume? If you're constantly exhausted, dragging through sessions, sleeping poorly, and seeing signs of burnout, your volume might be too high or stacked in the wrong way. But don't confuse always feeling fresh with doing it right. If your training never leaves you a little drained, never requires real recovery, you might simply not be doing enough. Training should occasionally feel like work. If it doesn't, it's not volume, it's just exercise. Second, is your current volume producing progress? This is the big one. If your pace, power, endurance, or race outcomes haven't improved in six to eight weeks, your volume may be insufficient to drive adaptation. It's not always about intensity. Sometimes you're simply not doing enough total aerobic work for your body to bother upgrading the engine, especially in endurance sports. There's a minimum effective dose, and if you're not reaching it, even perfect structure won't save you. On the flip side, if you're doing plenty and still flatlining, I'd politely refer you back to question one. And lastly, can you sustain this volume over time? Not just for a week, not just during your winter base block, but across months of training with real life stress layered in. If you're overreaching constantly, your volume may not be sustainable. But if you've been doing the same five to six hour weeks for a year comfortably ticking off workouts without strain or adaptation, that might be your real limiter. Sustainability doesn't just mean avoiding collapse. It means finding the maximum volume that you can recover from consistently. That's where the magic happens. If you could honestly answer yes to all three of these questions, congratulations. You've likely found your personal training volume sweet spot. High enough to drive progress, low enough to recover from, and realistic enough to repeat. But if one of those answers is shaky, it's time to reassess. That might mean backing off the unsustainable hero hours, or just as often leveling up your commitment, reorganizing your schedule, and carving out the extra time that your goals actually require. Now, I'd be doing you a great disservice if I didn't directly address the part the internet tends to butcher. Can intensity replace volume? The answer is sort of. Short term, yes. High intensity interval training can give time crunch athletes a real bang for their buck, especially VO2 max intervals, threshold blocks, or sweet spot sessions. In more explicit terms, high aerobic work. If you're new to structured training, coming back from a layoff, or trying to maintain fitness in a tight window, intensity can carry a surprising load. But those gains are front loaded. You'll plateau fast and your fatigue will spike even faster. Worse, you're gonna be layering intensity on top of insufficient aerobic development. You're building a house on sand. Looks good until it collapses halfway into the peak part of your season. And then there's durability. You don't get that from intervals. You get that from hours. Long, boring, soul-searching hours where your body learns how to fuel efficiently, maintain output under fatigue, and not implode midway through your target event. You can't simulate that with intensity. You have to earn it slowly, steadily, week after week. That's why the best athletes, amateur or pro, do not rely on intensity instead of volume. They use it on top of a well-built aerobic base. If you're short on time, yes, use intensity. But your long game should be finding ways to increase volume gradually over time. Not because it's trendy, but because it's what actually works. So before you swap volume for another round of more watts, less time, remember this. Volume builds the engine, intensity fine tunes it. Skip the engine and all you've got is a very twitchy radio. So let's put a bow on this with some rapid fire answers to questions I see come up all the time. For those who use popular fitness trackers or softwares out there, this is a huge one. Can I just train by CTL or fitness score and ignore hours? And if you're not familiar with CTL or chronic training load, I have a full video on that. I'm going to leave it down below and at the end screen. It's going to take a bit too long to give it a proper definition here. But the short answer to the question is no. CTL is just a rolling average of your training stress score. And TSS itself can be misleading. Depending how your workouts are structured, one hour at sweet spot isn't the same at two hours at zone two. Someone with lots of high intensity can have a high fitness score, but the athlete's endurance is built on a house of cards. And just as easily a cyclist who can ride like 16 hours a week in zone two can have a really high fitness score, but once the terrain or group ride gets spicy, they're shelled. CTL helps, but it's not the whole picture. And on that note, another question I see a lot is what about zone two? Why does everybody keep saying this zone is magic? And I kind of worry that influencer culture is turning a very important training zone into some sort of hype train. And with that, I think they end up creating more skepticism than support in the long term. Zone two is not magic. It's just extremely effective when done consistently. These sessions are not glamorous, but they're the bedrock of long-term endurance development. Think of them kind of like brushing your teeth. No one posts that on Instagram, but if you skip it long enough, things get really ugly. Remember that a lot of these influencers are targeting the untrained or even sedentary individual. Your mileage, pun intended, will be much different as an athlete than the person realizing that they just hit 50 years old and they want to roll back the clock on aging. Now, what about cross-training? Can I make up for volume by introducing more cross-training into my plan? 
To a degree, yes. Swimming, hiking, rowing, strength work, they all contribute to general aerobic fitness and movement durability. Replacing the occasional session can not only be a suitable replacement, but an enhancement to your training by engaging other muscle groups and systems that can make you more durable. But specificity matters. Running fitness comes from running. Cycling economy comes from time in the saddle. You can't substitute your way out of sport-specific work in any appreciable way. If you need to swap out a session here or there due to constraints, cross-training can be a really effective tool. But if it's comprising 40% of your training week, you're likely losing the plot. And then there's a really common big question. Isn't it better to focus on intensity if I'm over 40? It's tempting. Less time, more stimulus, preserve that high end while you still can. And yes, intensity gives you a big return in short window, especially when recovery is harder to come by. But here's the truth. Volume is still where your durability, aerobic base, and long-term performance are built. If you only chase high-end intensity, you're spending all of your training currency on volatility instead of stability. You do not need less volume with age. You need smarter volume, enough to keep your aerobic system efficient with just enough intensity to keep the top end sharp. Flip the pyramid, and now you've got short-term speed and long-term decline. So the bottom line is this, volume is not a shortcut, it's not a hack, it's a long-term investment. You earn it through consistency, good sleep, decent nutrition, and not breaking yourself trying to mimic someone else's training log. You do not need pro-level hours to get fast, but you do need enough training to trigger adaptations, and that threshold is higher than a lot of people want to admit. Train the most that you can recover from, not the most you can survive, and if you're chasing real performance, you're not going to get there on four hours a week in vibes, and you're certainly not going to get there following the 20-hour training week of your favorite pro, followed by a week of binge watching Netflix punctuated by crawling to your mailbox. But let me know what you think. Do you need to pull back? Add more? Did this help you to better put your training volume into context? Let me know in the comments below. And while you're down there, make sure to press all the buttons. You know, the algorithm gods really love the buttons. They're fun. They're free. They're oh so satisfying. You know you want to. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.